Uh, Luke chapter 8, and I'll begin reading at verse 26. It reads, Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out of the land, when he stepped out on the land, this is Jesus, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, this is Jesus having a conversation with a demon. What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged Jesus that he would not command them to go out into the abyss, solitary confinement. Now, a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And Jesus permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also, who had seen it, told them, by what means he had been demon-possessed, was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Amen. Luke 8, um, verses 26 through uh, 39. So much is, uh, if you allow me to say, jam-packed into this passage of Scripture. I read a, uh, I read a true story uh, from an article um, in the news uh, two weeks ago. And I I want to read it to you. I think it's pretty relevant to um, this passage of scripture. It reads, as the car carrying Katrina Alexander and her family navigated the dark two-lane road that snaked through the dense forests near Pilot Mountain in North Carolina, the mother's eyes were glued to her iPhone screen. It was late on June 7th, and Katrina was searching for her daughter, Macy Smith who had missed curfew and wasn't answering her phone. According to the locator app on Katrina's phone, the 17-year-old was nearby. The small pulsating blue dot that marked Katrina's location kept moving closer and closer to where Macy was supposed to be, when something suddenly caught her eye, a set of tire tracks running off the road. That's all I could see, Katrina said, but the app, Apple's fine friends wasn't wrong. Macy was there, hitting from view about 25 feet down the side of a tree-covered embankment. The teenager had been trapped in the wreckage of her car for almost seven hours, and she was alive. Having that location, if we didn't have that, we would have never known where to look, Katrina told TV station WXII. I'm certain that that is what saved her life. On the afternoon of June 7th, Macy Smith hopped into her white sedan and headed out to meet a friend. By the time she reached the winding road, it was raining heavily and the pavement was slick. In a Facebook post shared the day after the crash, Macy Smith wrote that her car started hydroplaning before careening off the road between two trees and flipping three times. When the vehicle finally came to a stop in the ravine, Smith said she found herself in the back seat, her left arm pinned beneath the car and the ground. 
The first hour, I was frantic, she told WXII. I was looking for ways to get out. I was thinking of just different things I could do. She immediately started searching for her phone, her mind racing with questions. What if no one could find her? What if she didn't have phone service? What if the phone's GPS locator wasn't working? But the phone was nowhere to be found, and the only thing within her reach was a Bible. The second I laid my hand on that Bible, I knew it was God telling me that it was all in his hands and it was happening for a reason. And that I would be okay, she said. So, Macy waited. She laid there and watched the sky grow darker, straining to hear anything that sounded like potential Weskerers. One car drove by without stopping, then two, then three. By nightfall, Macy told WXII that 28 cars had come and gone. Then she heard the 29th car, only this time it stopped. The sound of the doors opening and slamming shut were followed by what Macy had been waiting almost a half a day to hear the voices of her stepfather and brother screaming out her name. I knew they were going to show up, and I'm so thankful for my family, and we're such a tight family that I knew that I wasn't going to be there the whole night without them looking for me, Macy said. Her family immediately knew something wasn't right when Macy was late coming home and calls or texts went unanswered, her mother recounted. The lack of response was out of character for her, she said. Using the Find Friends app, which allows people to share their locations with others, Mrs. Katrina said she pinpointed her daughter's whereabouts and set off to look for her. On Facebook, Macy wrote that her family found her around 10.30 p.m. In addition to fracturing her neck in the crash, Smith sustained nerve damage to her left arm, which was stuck underneath the car, writing that she cannot feel it at all. Photos of the car showed a mangled white sedan missing its entire front windshield and several windows. Her mother wrote on Facebook that what happened to her daughter was a miracle. Amen. Friends, uh, Jesus paid a very high price when he went to the cross for you and I. And he did it because he loves you and I and wants to be with, with us. And he understands what we go through at times. There are times when we may feel like nobody cares, that nobody likes us, and you may be suffering going through some difficult times. You, you may feel like you're stuck in a ditch, pinned underneath the car, and it's getting dark. Through all of that, you can be sure that Jesus understands. He knows exactly how you feel, and he knows exactly where you are. He has you locked in his Find Friends app, and he's coming to get you, and there is nothing that will stop him. The sermon is entitled, uh, Behind Enemy Lines. Um, in this passage of scripture, I'll go back to two chapters earlier, because it's important. Luke is sharing in chapter 6 uh, that Jesus heals a man in the synagogue um, that has a withered hand. And that was a no-no. In chapter 7, Dr. Luke shares that Jesus heals a centurion servant. And Jesus, he, he, he doesn't touch the servant. He doesn't see the servant. He just speaks the word. And distance doesn't matter. As soon as Jesus speaks the word, the centurion servant is healed. In chapter 7, Jesus raises the son of a widow woman's uh, uh, son back to life. She's going to, 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 to bury her son. Jesus sees her pain and her anguish and her cries, and he stops the casket. Jesus is a mortician's worst nightmare. He stops the casket, and he changes the funeral into a party. The little boy gets up, and he delivers the child back to his mother. Here in chapter 8, just prior to this passage of Scripture, Luke, Luke, Luke tells us that Jesus is asleep on a boat. And all of a sudden, a storm happens, and, 
And Luke says the water is filling the boat. They're about to sink to a watery grave. They frantically wake Jesus up. Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die. Jesus, you guys just don't get it. He gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves. He tells the, he tells the wind and the waves to hush. Be quiet, be still. And immediately, there's a calm. Luke is communicating valuable information about Jesus. Uh, Jesus has power. He has authority over sickness. He has authority over disease. He has authority over nature. He has authority over death. Jesus, Jesus has dudamis. He has dynamite. He has power over the physical world. He has power over the natural world. He has power over the spiritual world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and everybody that's living therein. Because he founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the floods. Everything seen and unseen is under Jesus' authority. Jesus can handle what we go through. We may lose our mind and stress out and have anxiety attacks but Jesus can take care of us. I've got three signposts and I'm going to sit down so we can go downstairs and have some cake. I love cake. <laughs> Brother Moore, right now, I want to say pray for me, but that really ain't going to do no good because <laughs> I'm still going to eat cake. <laughs> but still, y'all pray for me. Yeah, still pray for me. I know it's not healthy. It's still good, man. Funny to me, I know all this Bible, but can't say no to a piece of cake. <laughs> I'm in the text this morning. <laughs> I'm in the text this morning. The first signpost is don't give up. Jesus is not afraid of ghosts or goblins. He's not afraid of the devil. Um, he's not afraid of our nightmares. Um, he's not afraid of our indiscretions. Our, our mistakes, our failures. He's not, a, he's not afraid of infidelity. He's not afraid of divorce. He's not afraid of, of, of abortion. He's not afraid of addiction. He's not afraid of what the enemy uh, uses to bind us up and to hold us captive, to, to bind us in chains and shackles like this, like this deranged, uncontrollable man here in the text. Jesus, he's not, a, he's not afraid of Jason from Friday the 13th. He's not afraid of Michael Myers. He's not afraid of the boogeyman. When, 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 when family and friends and loved ones walk out, Jesus walks in. When my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Jesus has an uncanny way of meeting us right where we need him. When the bills are paid, when the children are, are acting right, you know, we, we get a little bit independent of Jesus. But let some struggle let some happenstance, some, some negative energy come into our world. Oh, yeah, now, Jesus, I need you. And Jesus will be right there. I got you on my fine, friends. Here I am. Come to save the day. This man was a wreck. Um, his, his address was the cemetery. Uh, he was naked. He was crying. And in the Gospel of Mark, Mark said he was cutting himself, trying to relieve some pain. He was deranged and uncontrollable. And society couldn't control him, so they ostracized, they quarantined this brother. We don't want to have nothing to do with you, you cray cray. Is that you this morning? Do you feel alone and deserted? Do you feel overwhelmed by the issues of life? Sometimes we, we find ourselves caught in a problem and see no way out. Don't panic. God will make a way. Jesus says in the, the Gospel of Matthew, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, 
and, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you, you, you'll find rest for your soul. Je- Jesus is, is, one of the things Jesus is teaching us here is Jesus is going to make a transfer. Uh-huh. Jesus says, give me your shame, give me your guilt, give me your sin, give me your pain, give me your worry, give me your anxiety, give me your fear and your failure, and in turn, I'll give you eternal life. He says, the thief comes but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I've come that you may have life, and that you may have it more abundantly. What has eluded this this gentleman is now searching to find him. Don't give up was the first signpost. The second signpost is he can handle your issues. This man was possessed by an evil spirit. And Dr. Luke tells us that Jesus has a conversation with this demon. And the demon shares that his name is Legion. And he's in charge. He's commanding other evil spirits. And Jesus demonstrates his power in a mighty way here. The demon has this man naked and crying and cutting himself and and living in a tomb. And the demon bows down to Jesus, calls him by name. Like, Jesus, I really don't recognize you in this suit you got on. Because the last time I saw you, you were in glory and all of your majesty. What are you doing in a frame like this, in in a body like this? Even though you 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 may be six feet, we know who you are. And then they begin to compromise. The the demon begins to negotiate with Jesus. Jesus, don't don't send us to the abyss. Don't send us to jail. Don't don't send us to solitary confinement. There's some swine over here. Command us to go over here. (laughs) Jesus has control over all of your issues. You may not be able to control it. But everything falls at the feet of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' name has power. It has authority. I think it's about time we start using that name. This man has been hurt and wounded. And that opens up an avenue for, for, for the enemy to, 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 to come into your life and, and just work havoc. But the good news is, again, that Jesus can handle your issues. Jesus will, will he'll cross the lake. Uh, and despite what society does and, and, and just uh, uh, discounting us and throwing us away, um, Jesus, he, he'll find us and he'll rescue us. You know, Jesus says, they that are whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I have a sister. Um, my wife and I hung out with her just, a, just for a little bit yesterday. And uh, my youngest sister, Carla, she has this dog. You know, what, is, what is with these sisters and these dogs, man? <laughs> His name is Cooper, and he's a small little dog. Really don't, to me, fit the purpose of why you have a dog in the house. <laughs> but the dog just barks insistently. And I'm like, Cooper, dude, you, you've known me for the last 15 years. Why are you barking at me? <laughs> he just barks, barks, barks. And Bishop, so she, she had to take the dog to the vet to get his shots. Dogs have annual checkups now. Go figure. So he, he, she, she takes him to the vet. And um, the doctor, the vet there, he's a new vet. And he says, okay, I'm going to take Cooper to the back. And we'll give him his shots and we'll come back out. And she's like, no, 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 no. I usually go back with Cooper. And... Uh, that's my baby. Um, and so the vet says, no, 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 we got it. We got Cooper. We got it. And so she says, oh, oh, OK, all right. And she sits down in the waiting area. So after a few minutes, she hears all this barking, all this whining, all this scratching and crying. And, and the vet comes out and says, uh, we've got a problem. And she was like, well, what's the problem? He says, well, he's, he's back here. You know, he's going to urinate. Of course, we understand that. But 
he's, he's defecating and he's vomiting everywhere. And she says, you know, in, in a sense, I told you, I have to go back with Cooper. He doesn't like nobody. She says, where is Angelo? Is Angelo here today? And the vet says, no, no, <laughs> Angelo has the day off. She says, because Angelo and I go to the back and we have a system we have with Cooper. And the vet tucks his tail and says, okay, come on back here with Cooper. We need your help. Jesus, y'all, is like Angelo, but he don't need no help. The demons, the issues, the problems, the, the, the indiscretions, the failures, Jesus can handle all of them. And it won't take nobody to hold you down and give you your shot. Jesus speaks the word and it's done. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. We heard it this morning in Sunday school. It says about Jesus, he spoiled the principalities and powers, triumphing over them in the cross. You know one thing I find puzzling in the text? The disciples. The disciples are quiet. Even Peter is quiet. They don't say nothing in the text. They're, they're, they're just observing what's going on. They just saw Jesus tell the wind and the waves to be quiet. And they responded. And now they're watching this scene play out. Jesus is talking to an evil spirit. And they're like, bruh. They're dumbfounded. Who, we've been hanging out with Jesus. We, we spend time with Jesus. We, we stay with Jesus. But who is this Jesus? You mean to tell me not only can he raise the dead, not only can he, he command nature and it responds, but he's talking to a demon, y'all. And the demon has no control over Jesus. The man is healed. The, the swine herders now have looked and noticed that Jesus has authority and might. All of their product is dead. Business destroyed. Entrepreneurs, they're bankrupt now. All of their, all of their business is over the cliff, choked in the sea. The townspeople come out. Oh, Lord, Jesus done wrecked our stock market. No more commerce, no more capitalism. Everything is gone. Supply and demand ain't no supply and demand. My question to you and I is, are you in the text this morning? Or better yet, who are you in the text? Are you like Jesus? Do you cross over a lake for the hurting, the hopeless, those who feel unloved? Are you like the disciples when in times of anxiety and stress and fear and not understanding what Jesus is doing, are you dumbstruck? Or are you like this man, naked? Maybe not physically, but naked. Are you crying and cutting yourself? Or are you like the, the swine herders? As long as your money is good, you and Jesus are good. But let somebody touch your pocketbook and all hell breaks loose. Or are you like the townspeople? Jesus, it's time for you to go. Yeah, we love listening to you preach. Yeah, we, we, we love joining others, singing to your praise and your honor and your glory. But man, you messed up my 401k plan, my retirement and my pension, my portfolio. Bye-bye. Who are you in the text? 
One of these characters represents who you are. Jesus is, if Jesus was here today, uh, Jesus would be a wanted man. And they, they, they certainly will look to arrest, try, and convict Jesus. Um, um, the FDA would want Jesus for turning water into wine. The EPA would want Jesus for killing fig trees. The AMA would want Jesus for practicing medicine without a license. The Department of Health would, would want to arrest Jesus for opening graves and for feeding, uh, feeding 5,000 without a permit. The NEA would want to get Jesus for teaching without a license. The NOW, the National Organization of Women, would certainly want to get Jesus for not assigning a woman as a disciple. Osho would want to get Jesus because he's walking on the ocean without a life jacket. The SPCA would want to get Jesus because he just killed 2,000 swine in the ocean. No doubt the National Board of Psychiatrists would want to talk to Jesus for giving people advice on how to live a guilt-free life. The interfaith movement will want to talk to Jesus for really just uh, putting down all other religions because Jesus will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. All of y'all dismissed. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus walked the earth today. <laughs> he would be a wanted man. And since he doesn't walk the earth today, you and I do. We are to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. We are to be salt and light everywhere we go. My final, my final signpost is this. Jesus will give you something to talk about. Um, salvation changes things. Sal salvation changes you. It changes me. It changed this man. Um, this naked man was found clothed. This deranged and uncontrollable man was found sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind, and it freaked everybody out. Amen. The scripture says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. I'll bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him. And then Paul says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul would say to the church in Ephesus, now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power of that works in us. Uh, uh, anybody familiar with uh, Mari Povic? Yeah, the Mari Povic show. <laughs> it's been on TV since 1995. That's a long time. 24 years. And it's famous for really one thing. Those doggone paternity tests. <laughs> Miss, Miss, Miss Pearl, they, they bring all these, these females. This is just wrong. You know, she claiming that's my baby daddy. He looking at Mari like, wasn't me. Ain't me. And you know what Mari Povic does. He got, the, he got the piece of paper sitting in front of him. He just, you know, he's, he just stresses it out. <laughs> Till finally, you know, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll say, you know, you are not the father, or you are the father. Um, I want to thank God in my Mari Povic's voice. God is my father. I belong to him. The DNA matches. The blood is Jesus Christ in me. Spiritually speaking, I'm related to him. He's my older brother. Uh, see, salvation changes a person. It changed Abram to Abraham. It changed Sarai to, to Sarah. 
It, it, it changed Jacob into Israel. It, it, it changed Rahab the harlot into a housewife. It changed Paul, a murderer, into an apostle. And it changed this deranged man into a missionary, into an evangelist. Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to be with you. No, 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 no. I, I don't need 13 in the boat. I need you to go back home and tell everybody where you live what God has done for you. That's the assignment. If the Lord has done anything for you, come on now, tell it. That's the assignment. Jesus heals. Jesus delivers. Jesus imparts salvation. And yeah, he does it because he loves you. And yes, Jesus wants us to share it. This man has a powerful testimony. And everybody in that region knows it. You have a powerful testimony. God has done some great things in your life. And someone needs to hear it. Someone needs to, to hear you express how God has blessed you and delivered you and opened doors for you. And, and all the things that he's brought you through and out of, somebody needs to hear it. God wouldn't have done it for any other reason. Y'all know that, right? He just doesn't do it just to be doing it. Your deliverance is for me. I need to hear it. The person sitting next to you needs to hear it. Hey, the person on Facebook needs to hear it. Wherever your network is, that's where it needs to be heard. Um, let's stand and let's sing number 99. Jesus has made it all right.